Okay, good afternoon. Today we have a special seminar at uh, this time, uh, tea time, and uh, we have the talk by Dr. Valentin Mar Martinez Piliet. He will uh, talk about a Spanish in Boulder studying the sun in both sides of the Atlantic and how R&D is organized in them. Valentin will be properly introduced by Dr. Isabel Marquez, who is the scientific director of the Severo Ochoa program at the Instituto Astrofisica de Andalusia. Isabel, please. Hello, everybody. Good, good afternoon for most of us and good morning for, for Valentin. Uh, thank you very much for having accepted our, our invitation. Thank you all for being here in this new uh, Severo Ochoa colloquium. Um, Dr. Valentin Martinez Pillet is director of the National Solar Observatory in Boulder, in Colorado, in the United States, and is member of our external scientific advisory board in, of the IAA. We had already the pleasure of having him here in, in February, last February 2020, a couple of weeks before the confinement started and all the subsequent weird lifestyle we were forced to follow. So um, this is what we have now. Dr. Martinez Pillet is a solar physicist. He got his PhD in astrophysics at the University of La Laguna in Spain in 90, 1992. He has uh, worked at the High Altitude Observatory NCAR in Boulder in Colorado, the University of La Laguna and the um, Instituto Astrofisica de Canarias. He has been the principal investigator of several instrumentation projects like um, IMAX, the um, Imaging Magnetographic Experiment for the Sunrise Balloon Solar Telescope, or uh, the Polarimetric and Helioseismic Imager for the ESA NASA Solar Orbiter mission. He has participated at uh, an important number of scientific advisory committees, just to say a few of them. He was member of the review board of the Spanish National Program for Astronomy and Astrophysics in uh, 2004. He was president of the Division II of the International Astronomical Union, uh, the Sun and the Heliosphere between two, uh, 210 and 212. Member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Kippenhauer Institute for uh, Solar Physics since 2014. And he's member of the edit editorial board of the journal Solar Physics since 2004. He's author of more than 250 entries in NASA ABS with more than uh, 5,400 citations, so with an H index of 42. He has published about 130 papers in reviewed journals, given more than 25 invited reviews, and about 100 oral and poster contributions. He has super supervised three doctoral thesis and mentored a number of uh, postdoctoral post researchers. Today, he will give us his talk, as uh, René said, entitled A Spanish in Boulder, studying the sun on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, I take the opportunity to uh, extend the invitation to, uh, to a real one, to a 3D one uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, so thank you very much again, Valentin, and now the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you for the 3D invitation. I look forward to it. Uh, and, but, but thank you for inviting me to this uh, Severo Ochoa series. I've been following it. And I think it's a great effort that IA has been doing. I was totally honored to be invited uh, to give this presentation. Here you have my title. Finally, it's more complicated than what I thought. So rather than trying to make sense of the title, what I wanna do is spend some time explaining the flow of the talk. And here you have what I'm gonna be addressing, the various points that I'm intending to, to present here. This is going to be like an overarching scientific theme, which I call the magnetic connectivity in the heliosphere. And I will start explaining how we got here, how we are asking the questions what we're asking today. But I'll put in this context, uh, all of the efforts on spectropolarimetry that I started on the Canary Islands, but they are also present at the IAA in Granada. And you'll see how it connects to this, this magnetic connectivity problem. Uh, as part of this, this understanding of how we are connected in the heliosphere, we did a number of experiments. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna be saying something about sunrise, also solar orbiter. These were uh, scientific projects that had to be funded 
And the opportunity of doing Sunrise and Solar Orbiter really allowed me to understand how research and development was at that time uh, structured in Spain. And then I jumped into the US, that was about eight years ago. And my job here is to actually deal with the research and development here in the US. So I got to know both of them. And I thought it would be interesting to actually compare them and explain you how they are structured in the two countries, how different they are. Not trying to say which one is better, but just try to show that they can be really, really different in particular as it pertains to, to astronomy. And then because I thought that ending with programmatic aspect was very depressing, I decided to circle back to science and I'll be ending my talks uh, going back to the magnetic connectivity in the heliosphere. But I'm gonna be presenting two very different topics. One that is, as I said, research to operations, very pragmatical, very operationally oriented. And another one where I'll bring solar orbiter uh, that is more fundamental research on how the sun creates and control the, the, the heliosphere. So I'm gonna be jumping uh, from science to research and development to budgeting processes, but that's kind of the flow of the talk. And I hope this, this uh, introduction helps you understand what I'm doing uh, while I am making the presentation. So without any further ado, let me uh, start with it. Uh, yes, I'm gonna be talking about how stars and, and planets are magnetically connected. This has always been very important for the Earth, for what we call the space weather conditions, but we now know that this is also very relevant for the many exoplanets that we're finding in the galaxy. Oftentimes habitability conditions, like what I illustrate here for, for planets like Proxima b, really depend on the magnetic activity of the parent star, uh, these uh, red dwarfs are very uh, active magnetically. And here you even have the planet that is immersed in one of these ejections. We don't know if uh, Proxima b has these ejections, but we know they do occur on the sun. And the sun does have what we call coronal mass ejections. Here you have a cartoon explaining some of the logic behind. It comes from a dynamo in the interior, but then in the end there is a mass ejection from the sun that is magnetized. And it comes towards the earth and it will interact with the earth. What I want you to see uh, on this cartoon is this part over here. Uh, this is the Earth. The Earth has its own magnetic field. And on the day side of the Earth, the magnetic field is pointing upwards. Uh, these are these arrows that are pointing out. What we now know is that it's absolutely critical to understand how the magnetic field of the blob of plasma coming from the sun is oriented relative to the magnetic field of the Earth. If it is oriented, upwards, like the blue color on the Earth, the interaction is small. But if it is oriented like in the cartoon, in yellow, pointing downwards, then is when you can have the magnetic reconnection. Then is when you have these two magnetic field lines joining each other through these reconnection processes. And it is at that time that really the Earth is connected back to the sun. Particles from the sun enter into the Earth's atmosphere and create the big, the large geomagnetic storms that are a problem for our technological society. They create auroras, but they also create all types of problems with communications with GPS systems. What I wanna emphasize here is that whether the magnetic fields from the sun comes pointing down downwards or upwards, it's absolutely key. And we only learn about this over the last couple of decades. We didn't know this when I started uh, uh, doing solar physics. It's something that we've learned and we are targeting understanding how we can predict how the solar magnetic fields are gonna come at 1 AU when they reach the earth. But let me tell you where we are. Uh, um, the first thing I'm, in, in terms of these predictions of the, of the magnetic component of the sun, uh, what I wanna start saying is, is the sun good at creating these explosions, the, the ejections that uh, you see in these cartoons over here? And the sun is actually pretty good at doing that. Here you have data from the SOHO satellite. This is 2003, this is solar maximum. And what you have in this movie is 12 days of uh, solar activity. And in 12 days, you'll see how many ejections occur. There are ejections that are uh, flying at 90 degrees from our line of sight, but there are ejections that are doing a direct hit to the spacecraft. And those that are hitting the spacecraft are the ones that create all these energetic particle interactions of these uh, saturated pixels. 
Uh, each one of these is a coronal mass ejection. So you see how often the sun is able to do that. At solar minimum, it's not as active, but at solar maximum is, is four times a day that it does one of these ejections. So they are actually very common. And these are the way in which we are connected to the sun in the most energetic manner. There are other ways uh, in which we are connected to the sun and I'll explain them in a second. But these are the ones I'm gonna be referring to. These are the ones where we need to know when they come to the earth, how their magnetic field of these clouds is oriented. Uh, these pictures are beautiful from the SOHO satellite at L1. Uh, how much of the signs that we see here do we understand? Let me show you these models uh, in here that I'd like to show. This is the uh, view from the ecliptic plane from the north, from the top. So what you have in here is the sun and this in here is the earth. So this is one astronomical unit. And you see two things here. One is a background magnetic field. The background magnetic field has a spiral shape. We call this the Parker spiral. And this spiral is where the solar wind flows normally. And actually here you have Venus and Venus is connected to the sun through the regular spiral and through the regular solar wind. This is a, a less energetic way of being magnetically connected to the sun. Same for the earth, you have the spiral here, but then the sun, has a coronal mass ejection that actually is a direct hit to the earth. And it's this cloud that propagates. Is this just a model? Is this just uh, a simulation or is this driven from data? It's actually driven from data. And here you see the date. So this is how we are predicting the connectivity in the heliosphere is. And what is the data that we use to drive these models? Uh, there are two types of data and they are actually very different. One is we start with the solar magnetic fields. Actually, solar magnetic fields are observed from the GONG network. The GONG network is one of the uh, instruments that we operate at the National Solar Observatory here in the US. From this network, we get these magnetic fields. And from these magnetic fields, we compute Parker's spiral. I don't know if you can read it, but here it says GONG. This is the data that you have in here. And then it says WSA, one chiliargy. This is actually the, actually the numerical model that creates the spiral in here. But then on top of that, there is Enlil. Enlil is what creates the coronal mass ejection, the cloud that you see right here. And it's hitting the earth. But it's a fundamental distinction between one ciliargy from Gong and Enlil. One ciliargy is magnetized. It does have a magnetic plasma. And you can go to the model here and ask, what is the magnetic field? What is the strength? What is the direction? But Enlil, however, doesn't have any magnetic information. If you go to the cloud in here, you do not get the information of the magnetic field. And as I said, it's absolutely crucial to understand if the magnetic field from this CME is, is parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field of the Earth. Because depending on that, you'll get the auroras, the bigger solar storm, or much weaker ones. Uh, this is actually something that we're doing in real time. And I went this morning to the uh, NOAA SWPSI website and I downloaded the prediction for today. This is the situation in the heliosphere right now. And actually the earth got hit by a CME uh, starting a couple of days ago. Uh, the CME has just flown past the earth. It's over here, this is the earth. And here you have the prediction for both plasma and velocity, but you don't have a prediction for the magnetic field for BC because we're not able to produce them yet. However, you can go to Twitter and if you follow Halo CME, uh, you'll see that this uh, Twitter account is telling us, we got the storm, uh, some KP equal five, which is a medium solar storm. Uh, but actually the Twitter account says BC was mostly pointing, it was parallel to the uh, magnetic field of the earth. So we didn't get a big storm, we didn't get the big auroras because actually BC needs to be negative. This is how popular it is that it is even on Twitter, but actually it's something that we learned over the last 10, 20 years. So I'm fascinated that actually you can go to Twitter and uh, then see people talking about BC, the sign of the uh, magnetic clouds, even though we're not able to predict. Now, let me uh, forget about Twitter for a second and let's go back to the basics, how it all starts on the sun. Here you have a filament, uh, is this black feature over here. And see what happens with the black feature. It is there and all of a sudden, sudden it's gone. Where is the black feature? The black feature is actually flying through interplanetary space. It, a flare has occurred uh, and then the filament is flying through the uh, interplanetary space. But what is important, 
is, where, and I like always to mention this paper over here, this paper is for 93, is that the flare is not the relevant aspect. We've been uh, observing flares in solar physics for centuries, actually. But this paper, published in 93 by Jack Goslin, with a beautiful title, The Solar Flare Myth, say, hey, stop looking at the flares. The flare is not relevant. What is relevant is the ejection, the filament that is flying in interplanetary space. Because you need the flare, you need the ejection. The ejection needs to hit the Earth, and it has to have the right orientation of the magnetic field to produce the big geomagnetic storms. But as I said, we're not able to predict these orientations yet. And here is where all the work that has been done on the Canary Islands, but also in the, at the IAA in Granada, is becoming really, really relevant these days. Can we measure the magnetic field of these filaments? Is there any way in which we can start uh, producing information about what the orientation of the magnetic field is and start propagating magnetized CMEs? This is where spectropolarimetry is going to play a crucial role. Here you see data. This is data from the telescopes on the Canary Island. This is uh, there is a photospheric line over here. This is the data that the solar group at IAA has been showing always about the Stokes parameters, uh, inversions, uh, the fits that we do, and the in inferring the magnetic field. What is important here is that this is the photospheric part of the magnetic field, but we are also able to measure the magnetic field inside the filament, the magnetic field of the part of the sun that is going to start flying in the interplanetary medium. And with this spectropolarimetry, we can get the global configuration of the magnetic field. So here the question is, well, these CMEs that we propagate now with Enlil do not have magnetic field. Can we start grabbing all this knowledge and producing models that propagate the magnetized CMEs and start predicting BC and understanding how important a given CME is gonna be for space weather uh, predictions. This is where we're heading and this is where all this knowledge that has been developed uh, at the IC with the telescope in the Canary Islands, but that continues uh, in, in Granada, the IAA, is going to play a crucial role in, in what we call a space weather component. Uh, I'm emphasizing here the filaments, but of course the sun is a magnetized body, and we like to understand the magnetic connectivity at all aspects. And that's why we created the Sunrise Project. The Sunrise Project, which started actually in the year 2000, was to have the best resolution and the best sensitivity on solar magnetic fields. Uh, this project uh, that you see here, this is the, the launch in 2009. And here you see Solar Orbiter. These two experiments have always been uh, related to each other. Right now, the leadership for both Sunrise and Solar Orbiter is with Jose Carlos is at IAA. He's been there for quite some time. Uh, Jose Carlos has been leading the project for the last nine years. Um, but the balloon here, the Sunrise project, was created for having the best sensitivities and resolution, as I was saying, of the same magnetic fields, not of filaments, of other components on the sun, but the same type of, type of approaches, same type of data, same type of analysis. It was a huge success. The first balloon flight took place in 2009. And here you see the group that launched the balloon. Uh, of course, it was a team effort. And if you look carefully here to who is in, in this picture, you'll actually find five people from the IAA in Granada. And all of them, uh, the entire team was important in the success of Sunrise. Two people that I wanna uh, emphasize, that I wanna express my gratitude for all their personal efforts that they made in Sunrise. And without these efforts, Sunrise would have never been successful are Jose Carlos and Antonio Lopez. Uh, they were great colleagues. Uh, they dedicated a large amount of time for the success of the Sunrise Balloon. They are still doing it, and they're intending to fly for a third time Sunrise next year. I hope I can join uh, with our suite of telescopes from the National Solar Observatory. But from here, uh, thank you for all the effort you did. Uh, let's get the shots. Let's go for a beer. I'm already fully vaccinated, and I hope I can go to, to Granada for this 3D invitation in a, in a safe manner. So Sunrise was highly successful, and, but it was a research project. And how was the project funded? Uh, I'm going more into these programmatic aspects. This is the structure for research and development that I saw in Spain that funded Sunrise. I know it's different now. I know it has changed, uh, but this is the one that we used at the time. And I prepared this slide for a presentation that I gave to Spanish scientists here in the US. It's called a group ECUSA. 
Uh, and I presented this trying to tell them, well, there might be problems, but you can get research funded in Spain and be very competitive at international levels. And that's the system that we use for creating sunrise, for starting solar orbiter. Uh, and that was very competitive and it did work. So there is hope that we can do competitive science in Spain through this system in here. But there are a few caveats. Uh, one of them is I created this slide. Uh, that was four years ago. And I had here a minister. And when I was preparing this talk, I realized, well, the minister has already changed and it's different. When we, were, when we were creating Sunrise, when we were submitting proposals for Sunrise, one of the ma main caveats we had was precisely how many changes of minister we saw. This was a gap in funding. It was a problem for doing the projects in a more or less straight way as our international partners were doing. And I would say this is perhaps the biggest problem that I saw at that time with the way in which research and development is structured in Spain. Other components that I want to uh, highlight here is that the research institutions like the IAC that I belong to at that time, or IAA and the CSIC, uh, are here flowing down directly from the government, meaning that they are part of the government, meaning that they are subject to public law and regulation. So the scientists here and many of us were aiming and parts of our life to become civil servants. And that's why this is how it is structured. Since in Spain, you are part of the ministry, you're part of the government, you become eventually a civil servant. This has good and uh, positive, um, not so positive connotations. Being a civil servant is probably a good thing that we all like to be. Uh, but at the same time, you are subject to these public law and regulations. And that's a constraint. And I'm gonna compare this, how the situation is in Spain. But as I said, the major problem that I saw here when we were doing this project were, well, there were multiple minister changes. Uh, there was no overall consensus about how research and development should be a structure in Spain in a stable manner. Maybe that has changed uh, over the last eight years, but at the minimum, the ministers keep changing and probably that's not a good thing. And we would like to have more of a consensus and more of a stable funding uh, channels for research and development. Uh, so this was uh, what allowed Sunrise and Solar Orbiter to occur. Uh, and one thing that I saw here, and I may be wrong here, uh, this is something that I will be open to discuss later, is that the budget process was rather linear. Uh, the government decided the funding level for science, and that's what flowed down, uh, so very top-down structure for the funding, uh, from the government to the research institutions. Of course, the science is not top down, it's bottoms up. Uh, Sunrise was created because a group of scientists submitted a proposal to the research plan, uh, to the national plan and Sunrise was created. But the uh, budgeting process is rather linear and very much decided from above. As you'll see in a second, this is very different, uh, the situation here in the, in the US. And again, I'm not saying it's better or worse, I'm saying it's a structure in a totally different manner. Then I jumped uh, eight years ago to the US and here you have the portfolio of the National Solar Observatory. This is Boulder, Colorado. So we are here on the third floor. Uh, this is the building in the campus of the University of Colorado Boulder. This is our building in the island of Maui. Uh, this is Pukalani. This is where we're building the Daniel K. Nue Solar Telescope, our flagship a four meter solar telescope. It is on the island of Maui. It's not on the big island. It's on a different island. And I'll say something about the status of the telescope in a second. We also operate GONG. GONG is the one that provides these magnetograms that create the Parker's spiral. This is a network around the world to provide these 91% continuous observations of the sun uh, that right now is feeding uh, these space weather modeling. We have other telescopes. But what I'd like to point out here is that the National Solar Observatory is operated by Aura. ORA is the Associations of Universities for Research in Astronomy. And some of you, I'm sure, know ORA because ORA has this portfolio. And here you have what ORA operates. And I'm sure many of you are recogni recognizing the telescope and the facilities. Of course, there is Hubble, uh, Gemini telescopes, the Vera Rubin Observatory. This was known before as LSST, KITPIC, CTIO, the Daniel K. Nue Solar Telescope, and the soon to be launched 
James Webb Space Telescope. So this is Aura, and this is the National Solar Observatory. So how we see that uh, National Solar Observatory is it uh, working below the minister, like in the situation for for the structure of research and development in Spain? How is it? A structure here in the US is actually very different. And, and let me show you what Aura really is and how the funding flows here in the US. It is very different. One thing that I want to point out is that this situation has been stable for the last since the Second World War. So this is how research and development is a structure in the US, and it doesn't change. And that's something that is very much appreciated by the, by the entire research community. Um, there is NASA and the NSF that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. These are agencies. They are not depending on a minister. They actually depend directly from the president of the United States. Um, both agencies are funding the research of the community, which is university-based. Uh, and here you have the faculty. It's different. Here they'll have nine months salary. The summer salary comes from grants that the faculty have from both NSF and NASA. And sometimes you have self-funded centers. In this case, the researchers here, they need 12 months salaries coming from both NSF and NASA. That's one of the main differences with, with the case in Spain. Uh, and this is the community. This is the community that is doing research and they submit proposals to the NSF and NASA. And then you have the federally funded centers. And we are federally funded, both uh, NSO and another example that I put here is the Space Telescope Science Institute that operates Hubble and uh, soon after the launch later this year, James Webb Space Telescope. But in between the funding agencies and the federally funded center, there is a layer that doesn't exist in Spain, which is Aura. Aura is a mm, private nonprofit foundation. So we're not workers of the federal government. We are not civil servants at NSO or at STSCI. We work for Aura. We are Aura employees. But Aura is private, so it's subject to private law. We're not civil servants. Again, that has pros and cons, but it does have the flexibility of the, pri of the private sector. And for example, you are able to uh, negotiate salaries in here just because Aura is a private foundation. So there are no civil servants, uh, but you still are federally funded. So you have to support the mission of these centers is to support the community in here. This is the community that has to have the grants for their salaries. Here you have 12 months salaries, but you are the main mission of this center is to support the science by the community. So these are very different components from the way it is uh, a structure in, in in Spain, the research and development, but the, the thing that I value the most is how stable it is. It's been there since the Second World War and it's not changing and it's reliable and dependable. Uh, how is the funding flow occurring here in the US? Well, as I said, my impression is that in Spain is rather linear, it's from a decision at the government. Let me show you this slide. This is the funding process here in the US. This is a slide that my boss, Matt Mountain, the Europe president uses. And I really love it because it really shows how complex the funding system is in the US. The last thing that the funding system in the US is, is linear. And you might wonder, does it work? And the answer is most of the time it does work. And it does work and it's rich. May not be the one we wanna implement in any other country, but this one in the US has been there for quite some time and is working nicely. And it has input for many, many stakeholders. And by that, I mean, it has input from universities. It has input from for-profit uh, associations, for non-profit associations. And the input goes to the executive branch of the government, but it also goes to the legislative branch of the government, to Congress. And you need to have everybody on board for the entire system to work and flow from compelling signs to a funding framework that in the end will give you the dollars for a science project. Uh, this, as I said, has input from the entire society. Uh, it is a system that is complex that you need to constantly be working on to make sure that you'll get the funding for the projects. But it all starts with what it is a peer review type of system is the decadal survey process that is run by the national academies. You get these blue ribbon reports. Uh, soon we'll have from the decadals the Astro 2020 
report, DICIS, the Daniel K. Newell Solar Telescope, was heavily supported uh, for, from the decadal in astronomy actually 20 years ago, two, two decades ago. And what you get the support from the National Academies and from the discussions with the scientific community, then you go through this policy and funding framework, including the executive, the legislative branches. And then in the end, you'll get the dollars. But as we like to say here in the US, President proposes and Congress this process. Every year, the president will propose a budget for research and development, but then Congress will change it. And every year that I've seen here in the US, the process, what the president has proposed is very different from what the Congress has finally approved. So it's really a discussion ongoing here, and it is occurring right now for 2022, and it is very rich. And the entire community, the entire research community can influence and provide input to this system. It is a process that 20 years ago I started funding the Daniel K. Newell Solar Telescope. Uh, we had the compelling science, but we had to do all this work for getting the funding. Uh, Dickies is now reality. And here you have images from the second to last uh, on sun campaign. Uh, here you see Dickies pointing to the sun. This is the heat rejection system rejecting the solar light. Uh, I want to say something about Dickies. Where are we uh, with Dickies? Dickies, the end of construction has been impacted by COVID. We are now targeting November 2021. And at that point, we will start the commissioning phase. Uh, from November 2021 to 2022, we're going to have this commissioning phase where we will already start uh, running observing proposal from the community. We made a first call. It was very successful, 100 proposals that we received for, for Dickies, 50 has been accepted. And one of them, uh, at least one of them has a PI from IAA. So IAA in Granada is represented in the, the science that Dickies is gonna do during this commissioning phase. We're getting ready. We're not expecting further delays from COVID, hopefully. Uh, things are getting better uh, on the islands and everywhere in, in the country. So we'll start these observings, uh, observations of Dickies in, in November this year. We're continuing doing uh, additional on sun campaigns. And here you have the last one, uh, the last one, which probably some of you will recognize, solar astronomers uh, from the High Altitude Observatory, also here in Boulder, Colorado. They were there about a month ago doing the science verification of their instruments. And here again, you see from Dickies, Stokes parameters. This is I, Q, U, and V. This is spectropolarimetry that the groups on the Canary Islands and at IAA have been always uh, focusing their research. This is a spectropolarimetry stocks parameters from a four meter solar telescope. And this data uh, is just being analyzed now. Uh, it's brand new. Uh, what you have here is, is less than a few weeks old. So you would say four meters pointing to the sun. And I know this is always a shock for the nighttime community. Why do they need four meters? I always like to emphasize that this four meter is really science driven. And why I said that is because if you take the equation that is used in nighttime astronomy for computing the exposure time of what you need to uh, use for a star of a given magnitude with a signal to noise for a telescope of a given size, well, that equation is the one that if you use it, you'll get four meters if you put these numbers in here. And that's what we need to be in solar physics. We're not here yet. We need to have these signal to noises of about 10 to the four. We need to be able to, at the same time, resolve 0.1 or seconds. And we need to do it in 10 seconds. I've shown some Stokes parameters uh, for filaments, for solar filaments that were 10 to the four in signal to noise but they typically have several hour seconds uh, resolution and they take minutes to obtain. So solar physics is not here. We really need to be here to understand some of the signs that we want to uh, resolve, like the uh, potential existence of a surface dynamo on the sun, but also for the filaments that I was talking, for this magnetic connectivity, for understanding how the initial configuration of a coronal mass ejection is, you also need this type of requirements. You bring this in here and you're gonna need a four meter telescope. And that's why both Dickies and the European Solar Telescope that also has participation from the IAA, both are four meters. So it's really science driven. And once we get these requirements met, when we are able to have 10 seconds, 0.1 seconds uh, resolution and the 10 to the four signal to noises, we will be able to monitor filaments regularly. And if we monitor filaments regularly, we might be able to fit models 
better than Enlil that actually propagate the magnetized CME and start predicting DC, how is the orientation of the magnetic field near the Earth. These models are available. They are very heavily computationally expensive. Um, and they are only operated and run on a case-by-case -case basis. Here you have the model in Japan. These are two models in the US. I think there is a third model here in the US and one model in Europe. It's called Euphoria. And these models are able to propagate a magnetized CME. But right now, the boundary data is not driven from magnetic observations of the sun. And what I'm saying is, let's get the filaments. Let's measure the filaments with the spectropolarimetry that we now know how to do, uh, and we have the capabilities to do. And let's drive these models with magnetic data and start predicting BC. These models are already trying to make the best job they can to predict in BC. Here you see in red the predictions. And in blue, what was measured by satellites, what was the BC that was measured near Earth? Well, they are not that bad, but the problem is that the data that they are using as a boundary condition is not coming from magnetic field observations of the sun. That's what we need to change with a spectropolarimetry and start predicting this BC. I have already circled back to this magnetic connectivity in the heliosphere. And that's the component I was saying, this is gonna be really operationally driven. This is important for us as a technological society, to start predicting BC. Uh, and it's, this is why I'm calling this a very research to operations component. But there's another component that is more fundamental research and it's also related to magnetic connectivity in the heliosphere. Look here again uh, to one of these maps of the ecliptic plane. This is the sun. And I want you to look at this satellite at one astronomical unit. There are several coronal mass ejections from the sun. Actually, there is this one that is in black. It's a huge, it's the largest, um, uh, most energetic coronal mass ejection measured during the space era. But the point I want to make is that the stereo, who is here and is measuring the conditions at one astronomical unit, now it's magnetically connected through the Parker's spiral, but then three ejections come. And what it measures now is a combination of the three ejections plus the Parker's spiral. So at one astronomical unit, when you put a satellite here, you are impacted by multiple processes on the sun. And it's hard to disentangle which one creates what. Uh, right now it's a clean connectivity. Right now stereo has a clean connectivity back to the sun. But when all of these three ZMEs come, it's totally confused about these particles are coming from which one of the CMEs or from what solar wind. So what is the way in which you can have a more pristine connectivity to the sun, a more clean connectivity that you know, this that I measure here comes from that process on the solar surface. Of course, the problem is that you are at one AU and at one AU everything is mixed uh, after the propagation. So one way to get this pristine connectivity is just get closer. The closer you are, the more clearer is your connectivity back to the sun. So this is why the community has been for quite some time uh, proposing, let's get close to the sun. And this has translated into Parker Solar Proof uh, funded by NASA and the Solar Orbiter Mission that is an ESA NASA mission. Both of them, the intention is to get closer and that's to understand better this connectivity that I've been talking throughout my talk. Um, they are both uh, flying and Parker Solar Pro has already been measuring particles and fields in situ. Parker doesn't have any telescope looking at the sun. Solar Orbiter is different. It's not going to get as close as Parker, but it's going to measure particles and fields and it's going to have telescopes to observe the sun. And then we have Dickies with totally unprecedented resolutions and sensitivities that is going to be able to also observe the surface. So by combining these three experiments, we're gonna have both particles and fields and telescopes that will give us what is the counterpart at the solar surface of the processes that we measure in situ. This is what I like to call multi-messenger approach to the connectivity in the heliosphere. The multi-messenger comes from something that you probably have heard, which is this um, gravitational waves and trying to find the neutron star merger that created the gravitational wave. We've been doing multi-messenger astrophysics in solar physics and heliospheric physics for decades. It actually started with Ulysses. Uh, but what I want to say with this slide is that there is a decade coming that is going to be actually totally exciting thanks to both uh, this space mission and the combination with Dickies. Because they all provide new views thanks to being closer to the sun and new 
parameter space in terms of sensitivities and resolution. Let me just give you one case of why I think this multi messenger is going to be key. That's the last uh, science topic that I'm going to address in my talk. Uh, why I think this multi messenger approach is going to be key and fundamental for understanding the connectivity in the heliosphere. Uh, Parker has already done several uh, encounters with the sun, and this is data from the first encounter. What they found uh, is in here, this is what I want you to look at now. Uh, Parker has a magnetometer that measures the magnetic field where it's flying through the heliosphere. So what we were expecting Parker would measure is the Parker's spiral, the spiral that I've been showing you multiple times. So here the spiral is this smooth curve going down in here, or it can be the negative one, or it can be the positive one, depending on whether Parker is in one side or the other side of the heliospheric current sheet. Uh, and actually that's what Parker measure. So as you see here, you know, it kind of measures that. Here it makes a crossing of the current sheet and goes into the positive side. Uh, so it overall measures the Parker's spiral, but it also measures this forest of very sharp ups and downs. This was a surprise. They were known, but they were not known to be that prominent when we were closer to the sun. So what these things are, and they are called switchbacks, is the blue lines over here. And you see that the blue lines are radially out flowing outwards from the sun. But then they have these 180 degrees bendings that Parker has measured all over the first encounter. And the question is, what does create these switchbacks? You need to do energy. You need to do work for, uh, for making a switchback on the magnetic field line. And we need to understand how is it created. I think the multi-messenger approach is gonna be crucial to understand the origin of these uh, switchbacks. And let me uh, explain this with this graphic in here. Here you have two magnetic field lines at the solar surface. This is very close to the solar surface. This uh, magnetic field line A is creating the Parker's spiral. It's what we call is an open field line that will flow the solar wind and will go past the earth. Uh, but then you have also loops on the solar surface, like the blue one here. It doesn't extend into the heliosphere. It shut, it closes down into the sun, really at relatively low heights in here. And these loops have really been observed. So what can happen with these loops is that when they encounter an open magnetic field line, so this is positive and this is negative, the negative part and the positive part, again, reconnect. Like what happens at the Earth, when I was saying the Earth is pointing up and the solar magnetic fields need to be pointing down is the same reconnection. So there's a process of magnetic reconnection. And after reconnection, you have the magnetic field line going up, then the bending, and then going into the heliosphere. That's the magnetic field line here after reconnection, which is a magnetic field line B. And reconnection will create this bending on the magnetic field line that if it propagates, will create the switchback. Now, what is important here is what are these reconnections? Do we see them? Actually, we see them all the time. Uh, we call them cancellation, magnetic cancellation at the solar surface. And let me say that I think from a statistical study of uh, magnetic cancellations, the best job is the work that uh, Luis Bellon and his students have been doing for years. So we know these cancellations do happen. There are these loops that interact with field lines and create skin configurations that are similar to these ones that I have in here. Now, the question is, are they as frequent as the switchbacks that we see with Parker? Can we, at the same time that we're doing an encounter, measure with the best sensitivity and resolution these cancellations and say, well, statistically, they are the same number, and yes, they can account for the switchbacks. So that's how you are creating a multi-messenger connection. You're observing the sun and you're observing the cancellation. And you can do this either with the fee instrument, the instrument that IAA through Jose Carlos is leading, or you can use Dickies and you see the cancellation on the sun. And then if Parker or Solar Orbiter measure the switchback, you can start comparing and saying, well, this is the same process. That's how it all begins at the solar surface. This is the uh, connectivity from a magnetic perspective. There is another way of doing connectivity which is for, for reasons that are not fully understood, the chemical composition of closed loops is different from the chemical composition of the open field lines. So when you create these new connectivities, you are transferring chemical composition from closed magnetic loops to open configurations, and you're changing the chemical composition. So you're able to measure 
the changes in the chemical composition on the sun and in situ, you can also relate one to each other and say, well, this is the same process. Let me say that this is actually what drove the definition of solar orbiter. Solar orbiter was defined from this beginning as a multi-messenger suite of instruments. And you have the chemical composition part. This is chemical composition on the sun. And this is chemical composition where the space cast is flying. This is the solar wind analyzer. By comparing what you see on the sun to what you measure in situ, you can understand better your connectivity. The other one that I was also explaining in the previous slide is connectivity via magnetic fields, either with the uh, fee instrument or with Dickies and with the spectropolarimetric observations that they can do and with the magnetometer that is in situ. So how do I link this to Dickies and Parker Solar Pro? Parker is also doing this part closer to the sun. And Dickies is also doing this component here with our spectropolarimetry like phi, but we're also measuring uh, the composition of the corona Dickies can observe the solar corona. We actually have uh, received some incremental funding for uh, being able to detect coronal composition similar to what the SPICE is measuring. So this is the multi-messenger suite. I think actually the combination of these, these three experiments, Solar Orbiter, Parker, and the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope is really going to create an era for understanding how the sun creates and controls uh, the heliosphere and going to the fundamental physical processes. So we're going to be doing both fundamental research, but also this more pragmatic operations research of predicting BC. I think the next decade is going to be fantastic for, for being a solar astronomer, given all the experiment we have. And that's all I have. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Valentin, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, now the, the talk is open for questions. Please raise your hand before doing that, and then I will let you open the micro. And I will give uh, the floor to Jose Carlos, which, uh, who, who will manage all these uh, question and answer session. Jose Carlos. OK, thank you. Thank you, René. And thank you. Thank you very much, Valentin. Uh, 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 I think I think it's uh, useless to, to to thank you because we are, we are very good friends for for too long for <laughs> for too long, but uh, uh, it has it has really a great pleasure uh, to to listen to you. Uh, I think that uh, very few astronomers can give such a such a view such a global view of what solar and heliospheric uh, physics is and uh, because because uh, most of us are truly concentrated in a in a in a very specific in a very very small part of, of the of the story so it, it's a very uh, enlightening uh, uh, talk and uh, for us, it's a luxury to, to, to have you here. Uh, for those of you of you who don't know Valentin or are not star physicists, I, I, I can say you that uh, Valentin is certainly the most influential uh, star physicist, uh, Spanish star physicist in the world, but uh, probably one of the best uh, in absolute numbers. And uh, well, he has he has uh, demonstrated uh, his knowledge, and I should also thank him for for letting me let, letting me follow following him in in uh, in uh, creating creating what's uh, now is uh, the Spanish solar uh, physics. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, space Solar Physics Consortium. Uh, uh, before you, there were no no space solar physics, and now now the, uh, um, and up to five institutions are working together for almost twenty years, uh, pushing pushing to to study both the the, the sun and, and and also the heliosphere. Uh, in in a line in a line uh, designed by by you, 
guy. So thank you very much. And uh, I thanks, Jose. Now, now I really have to go there and invite you for a couple of beers, and and I will, as you know. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but. Better if you go for wine. <laughs> that you you're better in wine. <laughs> so so uh, uh, Miguel Miguel Perez Torres uh, as his man his son raised. So Miguel. Okay, can I, um, can I talk now? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, th thanks a lot, uh, Valentin. Very nice talk. I really enjoy it, and uh, yeah. Mm. A peculiar talk. So let me just go. I, I can I, I I have two questions, but one, one yeah. is a very basic one that you uh, that actually I wasn't understanding at the beginning when when you said that for the magnetic magnetic reconnection to happen, you need those lines to be anti-parallel. I mean the ones from the from the sun and then those from the earth. Then you, you explained this very nicely with this uh, uh, slide. But my question then is those coronal mass ejections from the sun. Or for that purpose, from any other star, can they can they uh, have different uh, magnetic field lines configuration? I mean, sometimes be parallel or anti-parallel to those of the Earth. Is that the case? Oh yeah, it, that's the, that is the case. And actually, there are so many processes involved in the coronal mass ejection that it almost becomes a random process. It's actually not quite random, and there is some imprint from how the fields are originally configured in the in the uh, on the sun so let me go back and share my my screen uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, but yes it can have almost almost any orientation but it really is something that flows down from what how it was originally created and I think it showed this um, that uh, this is the filament and do you see that is kind of a, a rope type of configuration where the magnetic fields are bending over each other that's, that's what they are. So this is not a linear structure. That's actually what we call it flat rope. And there is, so the, the, the magnetic field is bending in itself and it's really complicated. This is what gets exploded. Uh, and this is what, what expands in the heliosphere. So, and the explosions are as dramatic as the one you see here. So all of these processes can create some level of randomness. But from what we observe on the sun, we know there is some, some relations to how it was originally oriented on the sun and how many of this, how much of this twist the configuration has at the beginning. That's what we need to measure and that's what we need to start putting into models and propagate these magnetized CMEs. Okay, um, may I ask something else or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but when, when I was trying to understand this thing about the money, so thanks a lot. This was very clarifying. Um, you mentioned something about the cancellation, and honestly, I I just uh, I was distracted by understanding this my recognition. Could you just explain what do you mean by this cancellation? Cancellation of what? Yeah. Is cancellation is cancellation of magnetic field lines, so it's reconnection. Uh, right. And so the, the, what happens on the uh, is just how we put the name in solar physics, but it's reconnection. So I was talking about reconnection uh, near the Earth. So there is the Earth magnetic field pointing at. And I was saying there's a connection and this effective reconnection when the solar magnetic fields come pointing down. If they come pointing up, you can have the flare, you can have the CME, you can have the CME hitting the earth, but you don't have much. You need this configuration for getting the fireworks. So this is a reconnection. Then at the solar surface, we also see reconnection. And how do we see reconnection there? Because we see a black, black meaning pointing down and a white pointing up features on the sun that get together and they cancel each other. So with, what they are doing is they are most of the time reconnecting. Uh, and we call them cancellation just to confuse everybody. It is reconnection. It is not always reconnection. It can also be a submergence of a loop, right? So think of a loop uh, like the ones I was showing in the, in the slide. If you bring it down, you will also see black and white getting together and disappearing. And it's a cancellation process, but it's actually a submergence. So one of the main questions, and this is what I was saying that Luis Bellos has been working quite heavily on this, is how often is this a submergence versus a reconnection? But we know reconnection happens at the solar surface. Okay, I have two more questions, but just, I mean, I don't want to 
to, um, of course, other people will, will, will ask questions. Maybe we can continue later on or some other day, day. But just one curiosity. I mean, I, I was I noticed that this aura, this is something unrelated to you. Very aura. nice yes. talk, by the way. By the, you have two talks in one yeah, for the price. I know, I know. That's it's why I explained nice. that at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. So any idea why the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which runs, you know, ALMA, oh. VLA, uh, VLBA, so all these radio facilities are not included within the aura yeah, umbrella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's so. Is oh, this? That's I mean, they are, that, that's they, they are like directly, directly funded by NSF. Uh, oh, you know, so, so so is there any reason you know uh, about this? Well, actually, thanks for the for the question. Uh, I created this slide for the Spanish uh, Españoles Científicos in USA, ECUSA, and they really. They were very clarifying for some of the how things are structured. So what you're saying is that there is national radio astronomical observatories. NRAO would be one institute here, a federally funded center like STSCI or NSO. But actually at this level, there are many uh, private non-for-profit foundation. Aura is just one of them. And there is AUI, AUI, which would be at this level is the one that manages NRAO. Yes, that's and what right. is interesting. What is interesting is that at this level, you, the U.S. system does not only bring uh, private law; it also brings competition because these institutions are recompeted every five years. And maybe AUI has an interest in com in operating NSO or Aura on NRAO. They compete for the different federally funded research centers. So this layering here not only brings these these private law into research, it also brings competition. That's how rich the system is in the US. And once again, I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just very different. And it has competition at this level. AUI would be at this level, like Aura and NRAO would be a federally funded center. I know this is confusing for, for us as Spanish scientists. No, 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 I understand because we know about a, a UI, so thanks a lot. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep more questions for in the, to the end if no one, one else has. thanks a lot. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I can give the floor to Mark Bosel, who's uh, on his race. Oh, Mark. <laughs> Bosel. Hello, Mark. Hello, Antin. Very nice talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you for uh, listening. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, as, as, a, as a person managing, a, as a Spanish astronomer managing, a, a, an observatory run by a, a foreign organization. Uh, of course, I, I was very interested to see how, how what your experience was in the US uh, to compare it with my experience in like in the UK. Uh, and in, in the whole European constellation of, you no, know, the European landscape is quite complex too. Yep. And, uh, and actually you talk to American astronomers uh, and more often than not, they say, well, you guys are so lucky in Europe because you do all things right and here this is a mess, etc. Anyway, it's, that, that was just a comment. Uh, my, my, my question to you would be, um, the decadal uh, review of astronomy, uh, they, they have been a, there was at least one attempt years ago to do something like this in Spain. Something uh, connected to the RIA, Chile Barcons was, was linked to that. Oh. Um, I think that was the first attempt and uh, it, was, it was very interesting to do it. Uh, I don't know what came out of that. Perhaps just the, the, the reinforcement of the RIA as a, as a network of our infrastructures, which is you know, one thing in itself. But if you if, if we'll go to organize again a, a decadal review of astronomy in Spain, oh, how, how do you see it happening? Right. Uh, what things would work well and what obstacles would the panel find to actually reach useful conclusions? I mean, right, that, that, that's actually a good question, Mark. Uh, and I would love to learn about your experience uh, one day. Uh, so let me say what is what is important from the decadal process here in the US. And the Astro 2020 is about to be released. As soon as it is released, NASA and NSF, the funding agencies, are going to read it and are going to say, these are the priorities. So let's take everything and start from scratch, kind of. 
And these are the priorities. This is what the community is telling us we need to do. They read the decadal survey. They follow the decadal survey. And actually the process, the National Academies tracks how they are listening and following the recommendations of the uh, decadal survey. And that's built in, into the system here in the US. If we're gonna do something similar in Spain, and I think there was something similar done at European level, what is key is that then we say, okay, whatever the community recommends in the decadal type of exercise, the funding agencies need to follow that. Uh, that's kind of the S3 type of uh, model uh, that funding has to be available for uh, facilities that are recommended in the European S3 model, but they are not always followed. They are not always followed. You can be recommended on the uh, as an S3 recommendation, but then you are not followed by the nations, uh, by the by the member states of the European Union, and then it doesn't make any sense. So what is important is that whatever exercise the scientific community does is really read and listened by the funding institutions. If that's built in the system, the effort makes sense. If not, don't do it because it's going to be frustrating for the for the community. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any many hands raised. May I may I ask something else? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, Valentin. So you know, um, so at the at the IAEA, we we have started uh, you know an effort to to try uh, actually starting with the discovery of the Proxima B. I mean the the, the planet in the host. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So uh, it was kind of a trans, you know, transversal uh, effort. So now we, 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 I'm a radio astronomer, so and actually I never did any, you know, any solar physics. That, that I, I think it was recently that I really knew about the Parker spiral, these things like that. But the, of course we we are now it, it, it's really uh, very interesting to, to to see if there is any kind of star planet interaction in this. And, but they started from the basics, you know, it seems to me from that now it's clear that the structure of the, the magnetic field is clearly a Parker spiral for, for the sun, but it's still when I, still, I go through literature, many, many models for M stars, of course, I understand you, you may, you may not be an expert in M stars, I'm not, but I, I see that people still use, oh, let's assume this is a dipolar structure, you have the magnetic field goes as r to the minus three, or this is a spiral, 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 sorry. So r to the minus two. And, it, and it, you know, they, they, this goes to diff, very many different, uh, um, so, um, I mean, what, what you expect, the diagnosis is very much different. You know, you expect different, different signals. So um, what is your idea about that? I mean, perspective. <laughs> so for creating a spiral, you have to have a solar wind. If the conditions are not those that create a stellar wind, you're not gonna have a spiral because nothing is gonna actually open the field lines and create the spiral. Um, so um, uh, a solar type of star, you will have always a solar wind and you will always have uh, a spiral. Now, I know that uh, there are heliospheric models, like the ones that I've been showing, I've been talking about one Chile RG, uh, but then I've been talking about these other models that propagate magnetized CMEs. And, and euphoria in Europe. And people are taking these models and adjusting these to other stars with uh, other stellar parameters, rotations, uh, magnetic fields, whatever. You know, you don't know so about something, you create a free parameter, right? That's what we do in astronomy. Uh, so, and I know that uh, at Boston University, there is a group that is using this one silly RG and trying to simulate the conditions for Proxima Centauri. So again, solar physics is doing this kind of Rosetta Stone uh, model that I like to mention always, um, where our knowledge is transferred to other stars. And, and this is happening. And I think it's actually very interesting. So I okay. think that's all I can say. Uh, then about the Proxima Centauri, um, I, I, I don't know for sure. I probably can ask people. There is people here at the University of Colorado Boulder, and you probably have seen this flare that it had. It was published like a couple of weeks ago. Yes, yes. Uh, yes this yes. is radio astronomers here at CU Boulder, and I know them well. So I can ask about uh, if they think any of these models. Uh, and I'll contact 
you back and tell you uh, what it, what kind of occurred. But I know these models are being used for other stars. Thank you very much, Valentin. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hear. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. <clears throat> So maybe I, I have a question myself. It, it, what's your 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 opinion of uh, new new projects like uh, Sunrise, uh, like the third edition of Sunrise, uh, or the future Lagrange uh, mission by ESA? Uh, uh, in the context of uh, this new messenger era, era, and the uh, and and in the thickest era. So yeah, it is so going to, to to look for for great resolution, and and how can we can we compete and and collaborate uh, and so on. Both, uh, but let me say something. I mean, you reminded me what Mark Balsells was saying about. Americans complaining about the US system, saying it's a mess. And you, you know, you've seen the budgeting process. It looked like a mess, but it actually is a mess that works. Uh, let me uh, also uh, comment that uh, when Americans are saying, uh, well, we're jealous of Europeans, what they typically mean is ISO. ISO is such a reference and well-organized system that really uh, Americans are jealous about ISO. Uh, but I wonder, and that's a different topic, uh, I wonder if today's Europe would be able to create ESO. ESO was created when the idea of Europe was different. So, you know, there are many things that are participating in here. You, you just brought, I reminded this because of what you, what you were saying about Lagrange. Uh, Lagrange, we would love to have something similar to Lagrange here in the US. And actually there are conversations about L5, uh, about L4, but the Europeans are ahead there. And it's absolutely key. I mean, is another way, it would be a, something we are missing today uh, for a space weather modeling. From Lagrange, you're gonna see the, 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 the CMEs, how they are directed to the earth. And you're gonna get, have advanced warning that we don't have now. Uh, so for a space weather is absolutely key to have something from L5. But then there is the physics. Uh, then there is what you can measure from, from, from L5. That is whatever will be seen from the earth a few days later. We don't have that information. Right now, the, the, these models of the, and that's something that I, I want to talk to you one day. These models of the heliosphere, they are using synoptic mass. They are using gong data, but it's synoptic. Synoptic, I don't want to explain what it is, but it's a picture of the sun that is, Somewhere is one month old. It's not current picture of the sun. Somewhere is today's vision of the sun in some other places is one month old. And that's because we don't have a four pi view of the, of the solar magnetic field. So with solar orbiter or with Lagrange, they're gonna have different perspective. We really need to combine the magnetograms from phi with the gone data and produce even better magnetograms for having better models of the connectivity. So the more, perspectives we have, the better the models are going to be, the better predictions. And, and that's where we're heading. This is going to happen over the next 10 years. And, and, and it's needed for both this connectivity between the stars and planet and for space weather uh, forecasting. Dickies goes more into the fundamental physical process. Dickies goes more into high sensitivity, high resolution, how it all starts. And Dickies is going to give us the knowledge of the how processes are starting on the sun. But of course, the field of view of Diggis is limited. So we're always going to need to have the GONs, the full disk from Lagrange, the full disk from Solar Orbiter. And that's like the same happens in nighttime astronomy. You need sometimes the high resolution, small field of view versus the bigger picture. So same, same here. Have I answered your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, and in particular, I would like to, 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 to listen to your opinion about the possibility of measuring the internal the internal mag magnetic field of the corona, so uh, think of okay. uh, of uh, real yeah. measures of. Uh, of the well, you know that's that's where Dickies is going to play a key role, and I have not entered into the fact that Dickies is off axis. 
So even if this four meter, uh, the footprint of Dickies is that of a 10 meter telescope because being of axis, you need a bigger footprint. Uh, but being of axis allows us to do coronal magnetic field measurements. This is where Dickies is gonna be really new territory, unexplored, and where everything we're gonna do there is gonna be new. Uh, it's gonna be new science and what the surprises are gonna be, I don't know, but it's perhaps what I think everybody considers, you know, for sure one of the most exciting aspects Dickies is gonna bring. We haven't uh, used jet Dickies in coronal mode, it's about to happen, it'll be this summer. And this is where we need to really understand, well, uh, how clean the day needs to be for coronal observations, how clean the mirror needs to be for coronal observations. There is a lot of, there is a very uh, steep learning curve for our coronal observation, but at the same time, the rewards are gonna be amazing. So that's, that's, you should prepare your community for coronal observations and coronal magnetic field measurements. That's what you should do in, in Granada. <laughs> And <clears throat> uh, Rene, Rene has. Yes, I have. Right, thank you. Uh, first, uh, uh, Isabel want to tell you that uh, she want uh, she need to apologize because she must go before sure. the end of the talk. So apologize from her. I have a very short question. Um, maybe it's related with your first talk. Uh, I try to connect the idea that you present with the appearance here in, in Spain that a new science law will try, they, they are trying to start a new way of financial and employment way of uh, doing things here. So do you think that uh, CME is coming to hit this uh, earth, this financial employment system in Spain? Do we need to start be prepared? For the CMEs? Uh, well, CMEs are hitting the earth all the time. And as I said, yeah. there was one yesterday. So uh, no, I don't know what's going on much in Spain in terms of these new laws. Um, perhaps, I mean, the discussion should be, as I was saying, uh, do we want to always restrict research and development in Spain to public law? Uh, and be constrained by the constraint from public law or do wanna bring private components? Or, and is this a useful thing to do or is the mentality in Spain in such a way that no, let's keep that model, that's not gonna work. I'm not saying it, it will work or it'll be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and actually there, is a, there are many factors one would need to bring into, into this conversation. And it's always a bad idea to just copy from a different model, one part of it and not the entire thing and copying the entire thing is very difficult. So I don't know what the status is. I mean, you would have to explain to me what is what the government is trying to do. I don't follow the news in Spain that much. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't aware of this. Is this trying to bring to the model in Spain uh, more competitive approaches or? That's a question. Yeah. Is this a question? I think this is the idea because they, they, they are trying to uh... My feeling is they are trying to go to the soft money uh, method and try to disappear the, the lower stage in the scientific career. I, so that's why my alarm system started. Let me, so the, why do we have in the US such a big community that is soft money funded? because there is a stability in the system. These people know they can submit proposals and they know it will be October 15, that the, that the call for proposals will come. And every year it happens. And they, there is this stability that is okay, you know, I, I'm a great scientist. I know I'm competitive. I'm gonna be able to get my funding every year. And that's why you have these soft money uh, funded centers here in the US. If there is no stability, uh, and I link back to, this comment of everything. There is not. There is not. If there is no stability, don't bring a soft money community because it's gonna fail, right? right. So, as I said, it should be the entire picture and uh, and how it's linked to each other. There is only one way of getting a soft money community, which is an interesting component, which is by via stability on the funding uh, 
timeline. Absolutely. Okay. Don't... Thank you. Luis? Uh, hello, Valentin. I have a question for you about Gong. Um, this network consists of uh, six nodes, I think. Uh, one of them is in Spain. In uh, it's been operation, operating for almost 20 years now, right? Uh, but it's really very important. Uh, so uh, actually, a couple of days ago, I, I learned from Twitter that uh, Gong is now going to be funded by, not by NSF <laughs> or uh, NSO. Uh, so can you explain to us uh, what is going on with uh, Gong and what is the future of Gong, right. uh, the replacement? Right, well, okay, so uh, these are good questions, Luis. Uh, and, and the person that is in charge of the station, uh, the Gong station on Tenerife was connected, I saw Pere, but he is uh, the PI for the Gong station in Tenerife. Gong uh, is all a very positive story. Uh, what has occurred, Gong uh, lifetime at the beginning was three years. And it was just to do helioseismology. It was just thinking on doing helioseismology solar interior. But then because if you do helioseismology by doing a small change to your instrument, you can start doing magnetic fields. And actually what they did is modify Gong for starting providing the magnetic fields. And then with the magnetic fields were starting to be important for the space weather community. And all these models that create the space weather modeling, the one Chile RG that I've been showing all this connectivity in the heliosphere really depend on Gong. So what happened is what here is calling the US research to operations transfer. And that's why I had it in my presentation, research to operation. Gong is a fantastic model of research to operations. Another one is LASCO in Soho, was research. And now it's, Soho continues to be operating the blue uh, images just because of the operational part. So these are two highly successful research to operation examples for the space weather. We operate Gong. And what's happening is that NSF is still funding Gong, the research part of it. So when we do research, we still do helioseismology with Gong, uh, and that's funded by the NSF. But the operational part is funded by the stakeholder that needs Gong data, which is NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. The center that here in the US makes the space weather prediction, that's the one that is funding the operational part of it. So it's a combination. And what you saw in Twitter uh, is that they are not only operating, giving us funding for operating <laughs> They are also implementing the pipelines at NOAA. Uh, so the pipelines are there. They get the data directly from, from the Gong station. And they want to have their pipelines there because these are operational pipelines. Uh, these are the security of the country depends on Gong. When the US government shuts down, and it does this from time to time, not for too long, but that, that's, that's a perturbation in the system. We get a letter from NOAA saying, hey, you don't have funding, you can go home, but you need to keep Gong operational because it's important for the security of the nation because of the space weather component. So what's happening is that we now have two funding sources, NOAA and NSF for Gong, but Gong is gonna continue operating for the next five years the way it is. And at NSO, and with this I finish, we are working in what we call NG Gong. NG Gong, Luis, for you in Europe is a spring. Okay, uh, it translates into, into a spring. We call it here next generation Gong, NG Gong, because Gong is so well known in Washington mm -hmm. that if I call something NG Gong, they listen to me more than if I call it a spring. Uh, but it's this collaboration for a new network uh, that we want to establish. And I think NG Gong spring, what they need to do is to track the filaments all the time we need to have a system that tracks the filament with helium 2030 spectropolarimetry, as I explained in my talk. And once there is a filament eruption, once there is a CME, we go back to the NGGOM database, we see how the configuration is, we put it in a model and we propagate the magnetized CMEs and we tell, okay, BC is gonna come this way. It's gonna be a big storm or it's not gonna be a big storm. That's what NGGOM needs to do. That's the new component that is missing in GOM but we now know how to do it. And that's a key aspect for us selling NGGON here in the US. Uh, perhaps it's a component that the spring emphasizes less, but I think it's key. 
we need to measure filaments and we need to track filaments all the time. But this is uh, still a bit uh, far into the future. Uh, uh, yes. This is what I think. So the, the, do you think that GONG can be maintained until this new network? Uh, probably yes, because there's a lot of interest, right? Yeah, it's my job. It's my job. I have to maintain GONG operational. If not, they fire me. I mean, it would be like this. So GONG is that important. We have some funding for refurbishing key components of GONG. But the idea, yes, we are intending to have gone for another five years. We hope NGGO moves fast here in the US. Mm -hmm. We have a proposal being evaluated right now for NGGO for the definition phase. The definition phase we think is gonna be three years and, and Marcus Roth in Germany knows all this very well. He's, uh, so we're thinking definition phase three years and start deploying NGGON net uh, sites, uh, it would be two, three years later. So we need GONG there for another five years. And we just signed an agreement with NOAA for having GONG operational and getting funding for operations from NOAA for another five years. So things kind of match, but it's delicate. It's delicate. Okay, thanks. Yep. We thank you very much. Uh, we are already one and a half hours. Uh, maybe, maybe. Just uh, the last question by Miguel, who's really interested in, 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 and keeps his uh, hand raised. And that's the last, I think. Okay, uh, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Valentina. Yeah, I was uh, so much, so interested. So I, I was really attracted by this um, mentioning that you said uh, there are two different, I'm sorry, the chemical composition of the closed loops and those that go out, outwards from the sun, they are chemically different. Yeah. And well, you, know, you have no idea, I guess, you know, they, they must come from different regions. I mean, one of them maybe from a deeper layer or some right. from a small surface, any suggestion and also how to really disentangle this, this issue, this, this problem, how to solve yeah, it? No, there are theories. There are theories for explaining why closed and open field lines have different chemical compositions. Uh, and, and it is related to the evolution. So yes, the closed loops, are more photospheric composition and they're coming from below. They have the same composition as, as in the photosphere. But as soon as they open, they go through the corona and they go through million degrees. And the processes that open these field lines and go through the million degrees is what changes the composition through a number of processes. There are a number of theories. It's not well understood. It's not clearly understood. I'm sure that solar orbit is gonna be absolutely fundamental and critical because of this chemical composition, the SPICE instrument versus what they're gonna measure in situ with our uh, chemical composition of the corona, we're gonna be helping there. It is a new area of, of uh, knowledge where we don't have the right data, but we're gonna get the right data. It is is not well understood. There are models and I can you know, talk to Jose Carlos and let's get in touch via email and I can send you uh, references for all these topics. and. And I know I've been talking to the group there uh, in Granada and I've been emphasizing that for what we need to do is helium 10 and 30 observations of Proxima Centauri to see if we see CMEs. That's what I would do if I were to have time that I don't have the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again, <laughs> Valentin. And uh, I, think, I think it's been a really enjoying talk and uh, debate. So, uh, well, Rene, you can say the last word. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, send to you the, the, the link for the, for the video. Thank you for the talk. No, thanks everyone. And I hope to see you all soon and fully vaccinated. <laughs> okay, thank you.